born and raised in Nairobi, Kenya, uh, on the east side, which was kind of like the ghetto side. And uh, my parents did a major thing, which they sacrificed to have us live in the ghetto, but went to the school in the west side, which is like living in Compton, but going to school in Beverly Hills. And that was because they wanted to sacrifice so that we get the best education. Um, and so I grew up in between those two points, seeing abject poverty and seeing great wealth. And that has become the very construct of who I've become and what I get to do is to build bridges across poverty, economic lines, but even more importantly, spiritual lines. And we know that as we look around our nation, this country needs um, some spiritual awakening. And I believe that God is gonna use people like you to do that. Um, so that's how I grew up. Yeah. Uh, my dad was a pastor. I came from a very good family, uh, Presbyterian pastor. But as, as of course, as a Christian kid and as a PK, you want to go the different direction. So I did. And so for, seven, for many years, I actually rebelled. And when I was 17, I was facing a seven-year jail term. And that's when God got a hold of me. And he said, son, I need you back. And I need you to take your crazy life and let's use it for a different mission. And that's when I rededicated my life to God. And, um, and then I wanted to become a soccer player and an actor, but my parents wanted me to become a lawyer. So, yeah, my parents won. I went to law school. Um, and they didn't have the money for it, and this is something I would like you guys to hear. They didn't have the money to send me to law school. So what they did is that my dad, being a pastor, he one afternoon asked the church to come back and he asked them, hey, I'm trying to send my son to school. Would you come and we're going to do a fundraiser? Try that in America. <laughs> Try and call your friends and neighbors to come and send one child to school. They would never do that. But my parents did. And um, that evening they raised a one-way ticket and a one-term fees into going to law school in India to a place they had never been. I was almost 18 years old. And they just sent me to school to study law, and that's how I ended up in law school. And so I was there for five years, graduated. And after that, I came back home to Kenya, and they asked me, hey, um, what do you want to do with your law degree? I said, I don't know what to do. So they sent me to the U.S. because I had some friends who lived here in Pasadena. So I came to the U.S. to try and uh, pursue law, but also continue with, um, with, 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 I wanted to become an actor and a soccer player. I wanted to become an actor. So they sent me here to come and do acting. And very quickly, I came here. And with the state of Hollywood, I realized I cannot hang there. <laughs> and so I gave up my dream of becoming an actor. And um, it, was through, <clears throat> it was during that time that I got to meet, I went to a prayer breakfast in Pomona, California. Yep, people from Pomona. I went to a prayer breakfast in Pomona, California, and I walk in, and unbeknownst to me was three of my childhood buddies that I'd grown up with in Kenya. And they just so happened to be at the prayer breakfast. Two of them at that time were actually attending Biola. Mm. Yeah. Come One on. of them is actually here, Kanji. Could you please stand up? That's Kanji. <laughs> um, um, he's visiting me from Kenya. He lives in Kenya. But he was actually our lead singer of our music group that became a boy band. He was our Justin Timberlake, <laughs> and I was... I was Joey the fat one, or Joey fat one, you know? So, um, but through that, um, through just meeting, we were divinely reconnected. We were not planning on it. We were not mm. thinking about it. But God just put us together. Kanji and the guys could sing. I was a hype man. I could make a joyful noise. So they told me, Christian, Sorry. just run around the stage and make noise. And that's what I did. <laughs> Pretty much that's what I did. But we realized something. We believe that we're, we're living in a very sight and sound generation, that our, our, our world needs people, unless they see, unless they hear, they cannot fully understand. And so we started using music as our Trojan horse to get us into places for two reasons. One, to draw people to the eternal nature of God, which is music and worship. And that's why the name Milele. Milele is the never-ending, eternal favor and nature of God. He is eternal. He's Milele. And so we did that. But secondly, was to draw people to rethink missions, to rethink missions. We had seen people do missions in a way that was now not as relevant as it was then. And so that's one of the reasons as to why um, we had the privilege. We got to travel to over 40 states in the U.S. Uh, every summer, we'd go to over 40 states, and I have had the opportunity of traveling to pretty much every state except Vermont and Maine. I don't know why. 
But um, <laughs> it's been an incredible journey. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little bit about my story and how I came to be where I am today. So good, Christian. Yeah. I wanted to be a soccer player as well, but I sat on the bench every game and I <laughs> kind of realized quickly that wasn't going to happen. So I'm with you. It's good. Yeah. Um, you are a missionary to the U.S. Yes. Can you tell us, as you have traveled around the world and around this country, how do you see the state of the church both locally and globally, and how has that compelled you to, to do missions here in the it's U.S.? It's good. It's good. Um, because of the work of the people like the Jenners, yeah. in the turn of the 19th century, you had 75% of the Christians lived in North America or the Western Hemisphere. Yeah. But that has slowly changed because the missionaries did such an incredible job. They did such an incredible job, and that's why we have to stop and honor and affirm the work that they did. Because in the late 1900s, and the, every, most 75% of Christianity was in the North. But that has gradually shifted to the point where now it's exactly the opposite. 75% of global Christianity is in the global South, and the North is actually declining. And so, but still, the Westerners are still sending missionaries to Africa and to other places. And I'm wondering, isn't it supposed to be the other way around now? Shouldn't we have more missionaries coming from South Korea and Brazil and Peru to come to the United States? to remind us in the Western Hemisphere mm. about the message that was once brought to us. Mm. And so that's one of the things that um, I think with Kanji and the guys we realized that we have a gift in our hands that we didn't even realize that we had. We had a gift in our hands, which was the faithfulness of the missionaries, the faithfulness of our parents, mm. who then sent us into this country, and then to realize that we have an unprecedented opportunity to make a difference as missionaries. You see, when we read the Great Commission, we read ourselves as Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, to me, as a Kenyan, why is my, where, where is my ends of the earth? Newport Beach and Irvine. <laughs> but Newport Beach will never see itself as an ends of the earth. But for me, as I read the gospel and as I read the Great Commission from my context, my Jerusalem is Nairobi. Samaria, Uganda, Africa, North America. But then my ends of the earth is Newport Beach. And unfortunately, the Americans have not understood, or the Westerners have not understood, that they are prime mission field today. Mm. The biggest denomination, the biggest, the fastest growing denomination in the, in the Western world is the nuns. Mm. And I'm not talking about the Catholic nuns. Mm. I'm talking people who don't believe in anything, yeah. you know? So this is a prime example for why we need to do missions here. And so for us, it's the opportunity to say, um, why don't we, why don't we then come in and be a part of revitalizing what was once brought to us? An example of that, of that is with our band, we were invited to public schools and we'd go and speak about the, 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 the situation of AIDS and poverty, but then we would talk to them and say, in the midst of the darkest, of the deepest darkness, our smallest light shines the most. And so we'll talk about the gospel in public schools. You try that in your public schools, you can do it. But for the African, I can come in, sing, dance, jump, shout, and they'll go like, oh, that's just a cultural experience. <laughs> so we brought our cultural experience of faith mm. back into the US, mm. and we only had, there's only one school, Bassett High School that had a problem with us, but even then they were not able to prosecute us because they said, well, we were bringing them as a cultural experience. <laughs> Our cultural experience is that in the midst of deepest darkness and people dying of AIDS, we have seen faith wow. vibrant and strong in a way that I've never seen in the US. Wow. And so that gives us the, that gives the, the, yeah. the, the, the impetus yeah. for missions yeah. in this country. So good. Christian, as our world has become more interconnected, mm -hmm. how have you seen globalization changing missions uh, around the world? It's good. Um, it's interesting to know that the missionaries of past, we, we have to learn a lot from them yeah. because the way they sacrificed, the way they went in, some of them would literally take their coffins with them because they knew it's a one way. Now, globalization has changed that. You can get anywhere in the world in the next 24 hours, you know? So that has changed. So we find that we can travel, technology, communication, it's easier to communicate. Um, 
um, then rising economies, the countries that were now thought as, as, as poor countries or were struggling. For example, 25 years ago, you should have seen the, the skyline of Beijing or Shanghai. It was nothing. Today, that's an economic power. We actually owe a ton of money to China. And so it's an economic power. So globalization has changed that. You've got South Korea that in 1980, their economy in Kenya was in the same place. But today, South Korea is, a, is the second largest sending country in the world. You know, second largest sending missions country in the world. So globalization has changed everything. But the biggest change of globalization is migration. You find that there's everybody, there's somebody from everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> if you go to Kenya, the people who are building the roads are the Chinese. You know, if you go to Brazil, you'll find people who came from Japan. If you come here to the United States, you don't have to go far. The nations represented here, if I was to take account of the nations represented here, you'd be staggered. So immigration has changed the way we do missions because now the people who are out in the far lands are actually with us. But unfortunately, we don't recognize that that's an important aspect for us to engage. We would laugh at, at, at very many opportunities where we'd go, we'd go and play at a church. And um, then they would tell us, we're going on a mission trip to Kenya. But nobody would ever stop and ask us, you guys are from Kenya, what do you think? They would go like, we're going to Kenya and we're going to do our own mission work in Kenya. And they didn't care to see, you have some people from Kenya, ask them, how do we go into Kenya and how is it that we can go in an effective way? So globalization has changed the way we do things, and I think it's for us now to be able to embrace the changing world. We do not have to go to China anymore as we used to. You know why? There's 400,000 400, international Chinese students in the U.S. today. 75% of international students will never enter an American home. 75% of international students will never be invited into an American home. The mission field is right here, but we do not even recognize it. And God is calling us to be able to stand in. I remember it, when I went to school in Pomona, I was never invited into an American home for Thanksgiving. It's until when I went to Mariner's Church that one family said, would you come for Thanksgiving? And I was like, isn't that a private event? <laughs> said, no, you're welcome to come in. And that family has become a real good uh, family to me and my wife. And just because they invited, look at the opportunity that is right there at hand of being able to rethink and do missions in a different way by just engaging some of these things. So globalization is an aspect that we have to consider and think. International students, refugees, people from everywhere being here, what can we learn from them? But what can we also be able to work with them so that they can change and reach their countries where they come from? So good. Yeah. <laughs> Man. Uh, Christian, over the last 100 to 150 years, mm -hmm. um, the American church has done some incredible things yeah. globally. And I found that for myself and often I think our generation, we typically either do exactly what our predecessors have done yeah. every step of the way, yeah. or we want to buck the trend and just go the exact opposite, opposite direction. direction. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. What, what can we learn from the, the brothers and sisters who have gone before us the last 100, 150 years um, and take that with us into a, a changing world. That's wonderful. I think um, there are several things that we can learn from the missionaries. Um, I think the first one is the commitment to the gospel. Mm. The commitment to the gospel and talking about just straight up evangelism. <laughs> you see, our generation has moved into social justice and that's okay. But in terms of proclamation, the missionaries knew that they're going to proclaim the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we've bifurcated that, and so the missionaries and the people from the 19th century said, we're gonna do gospel proclamation. And then for us, we've gone into gospel demonstration. But I think what God is doing is bringing those two together. Yeah. And I think Billy Graham and John Stott in 1974 at the Lausanne Conference were able to help us re-envision that. So we're now holding the two together. But we learned the, the commitment to the gospel, commitment to sacrifice. Mm. I have never seen such sacrificial people as the missionaries who went ahead of us. Um, and, and so watching them in their sacrifice, watching them in their commitment. And then one of the things I love about missionaries is that 
they had a, a, a view, a long-term view of things. Because when they went into places, they would not just leave. They would create a school, they would create a hospital, they would leave something that will go on after them. If you go to Africa, you'll find kids and places that are named after these incredible missionaries because they did an incredible job. They did not just go in and jet out. They went in, they incarnated, they lived amongst them, but they also said, we're not gonna just leave or we're not just gonna die, we're gonna leave something that goes beyond us because the true gift or the true nature of a person is what goes on after they're gone. And today there's schools named after these missionaries. So we can learn that. We can learn some of these great truths from just watching our predecessors. We stand, you and I, stand on the shoulders of giants. And that's why we need to honor, affirm, and bless them while rethinking those methods and the, and the, and the, and the, and the methods of doing, of, of yeah. doing missions. That's so good. I, uh... I'm a big soccer fan. Yeah. And, uh, What's your soccer team? Chelsea. Chelsea. I'm a Chelsea the fan. Um, the Blues. I know we're on. not doing too well, but it's you all know. right. Next year. Yeah. Next, next year. year we'll be Christian back. Christian Pulisic That's is coming. Good. You're a good man. That's why I knew. I knew I liked you. Likewise. I Likewise. Knew I you before <laughs> I met you. Wow. <laughs> Serenaded. It's amazing. Uh, I was listening to a podcast recently, and they were talking about why soccer hasn't become the biggest sport in America. There were all these different. Is sports analysts kind of giving their takes about why basketball or football are the biggest yeah. sports. And somebody said something that really kind of caught me. They said, America likes to be the best at things. Ah. And we are not the best at soccer, yeah. period. Our women's team uh, wins the World Cup almost every time, but our, time. our men's team, we couldn't even qualify for the World Cup. Yeah. And why is, it that, why is it that we in Africa and the global world take a ball, we kick it with our foot, we call that football. You guys throw an egg with your hand and you call that. Isn't that supposed to be like hand egg? It's true. You know, I don't understand. Yeah. I don't understand. Preach, preach. As, as I was listening to him say that, that we, we don't like soccer as much because uh, we're not the best. I think that that actually says something about us as yeah. a culture and as a country that um, it's hard for us to ask for help. Yeah. It's hard for us to learn from others. It's hard for us to say, you know, we might not be the only voice in this conversation. Sure. So as we think about now being uh, exporters of the gospel to the world, but also having the gospel come to us from other cultures, from other countries to, to receive mission work within our own country, um, <laughs> how can we practically change our mindset to be both givers and receivers of That's mission? That's good. That's good. I think one of the things, several things I can say, one is... Uh, we've got to understand that missions is no longer from the West to the rest. Mm. It's from everyone to everywhere. Yeah, come on. <laughs> and that means that then it has to be a giving and receiving. Mm. And in doing that, we recognize not to put down the American church. I've heard a lot of people try and put down the American church, and that's not okay because it's a great gift. The American church has been given incredible gifts, gifts of strategy, mm. gifts of technology, gifts of finances, um, gifts of planning, administration. I mean, those guys at Miners can plan the heck out of anything. <laughs> and for us as Africans, we just go in, we show up, and things happen, you know? <laughs> you know, we just show up. But mm. nobody really plans. So we can learn those things from the American church, but mm. also recognize that there's gifts in the African church, in the Latin American world, in the Asian world. Mm. I have learned so much. We would go to Sri Lanka, and our, our partner there, Pastor Adrian Divisa, would have a sit in the chapel with our legs crossed and he'd lead us through meditation. Things that we don't even have time for here in the West. As an African, I really appreciated that. I have learned courage and prayer from the church in the Middle East. When they take us into Iraq and take us into 30 miles away from ISIS, these guys are saying we still have to go there because we're not stepping out of harm's way. I have learned that from the church in the Middle East. From the African church, when Kanji, um, who's a worship leader, comes and gets up at Mariner's Church and leads us in worship. I have never imagined that the frozen chosen American church can be <laughs> able to dance, you know, because <laughs> y'all can't dance, you know, a lot. <laughs> but when Kanji gets up on stage and he leads them in worship, all of a sudden I see people who are prime and proper in Newport Beach moving like they've never moved before, <laughs> recognizing that there's a gift in the global church that we can embrace and receive. So being able to understand the gifts of both churches, yeah. 
and, and not realizing it's not the American independence, because as Americans, we're independent. We want to be strong, we want to be first. But on the African side, I'll speak for Africa, we're also very dependent. It's a very unhealthy way. But there's this beautiful picture in 1 Corinthians 12 that's about the body, which talks about this beautiful picture of interdependence. Yeah. I am because you are, mm. and because we are, you are, therefore we are. Mm. There's no self-made person in the global world. Not a single person can say, I became who I am because of myself. Mm. All of us. I owe my education to my, my church that sent me to India on a one-way ticket and a one times fees. So the idea of mutuality, mutual and reciprocal missions, has to be the mainstay. But then also thinking about things like poverty, mm. rethinking poverty. I think we've looked at poverty and, and, and looked at poverty from just an economic um, lens. And unfortunately, that is not absolutely correct. Because while we are struggling with poverty and abject poverty, the way we diagnose a problem will determine how we treat it. Yeah. So when you come to Africa, what do you first see? We need running water, we need education, we need food, we need clothes. And what we do, we take all these things. Mm -hmm. But we don't recognize that there's underlying and systemic issues that actually lead us to that place. Nobody stops to ask, why is Congo the richest country in natural resources, yet the third poorest country in the world? We never stop and think why. And if you were to find the answer, the answers are actually very deep. And it's not just about taking an education, it's not about taking, it's undoing things like colonialism. Yeah doing, uh, rebuilding identity because we've lost identity in Africa. Do you know that the name Kenya is a butchered word by the British? Mm. The, the term Kenya actually comes from the mountain Kirinyaga. When the British came to Kenya, they would look at a mountain and ask, what's the name of that mountain? And everybody would say Kirinyaga. And everybody would say Kirinyaga, Kirinyaga, Kirinyaga. And then the British could not say Kirinyaga. They'd say, Kenya, Kenya, we're just going to call you Kenya. Mm. So our country in Kenya has a name that is butchered by the British. Talk about lack of identity. How do you restore identity in a nation like that? Today, if Congo became who Congo is supposed to be, then Wakanda would not be a foreign concept because <laughs> Congo is really Wakanda. Come on, come on. You know? <laughs> Congo is really Wakanda. <clears throat> so we have to rethink concepts yeah. like poverty yeah. and see how do we... Um, rethink poverty. I think, I think, and I say this very humbly, yeah. when I came to Mariner's Church, I was floored by the poverty that I saw. Mm. I think the biggest ghettos in the world are gated mm. because people are so lonely, they have everything yet have nothing. And my heart broke. My heart really broke. In fact, on my third week at Mariner's Church, I said, after being here for three weeks, my heart is broken. I see people with so much, yet so little. And that's a poverty of spirit and a poverty of heart that is actually much more dangerous and more insidious than the poverty that we have in Africa that is of food, shelter, and clothing. Mm. And so we have to rethink things like poverty because of the truth of it, you know, we are all poor in some certain sense or another. Yeah. And so as we rethink that, then we'll, it will change our missions models. I, <laughs> most sermons that I've ever heard about the church being the body, that mm -hmm. some of us are an eye, some of us are an ear, some of us are an organ, mm -hmm. it's typically geared towards my local church congregation, yeah. Mariners or whatever church I go to. Some of us are good at this, some of us are good at that, and we all kind of play our part. But <laughs> as I hear you sharing uh, about your experience and what you've seen around the world, I think that in a lot of ways, that actually is referring to the global church. Yeah. That some of us have uh, a gift and uh, an ability to, to lead in different ways and uh, a stubbornness in a lot of our hearts has allowed us to only see the role that we play here yeah. in our local church. Yeah. Can you tell us a bit about um, the work you've been doing at Mariners Rooted uh, and how you've seen uh, a church here in Southern California embrace uh, a more global view of the gospel yeah, and the church? I was really taken aback by the church I went to, Mariner's Church, because as I told you, we'd travel many, many, for many years, about five years. We went to many churches around the U.S. And it was not until I came to Mariner's Church that they asked me, 
what do you think about what we're doing in Africa? And could you even help us do this? And I was shocked because it takes a lot of humility for an American church to ask for help or even to ask for insight. And so what I saw happen from there was our senior pastor take a posture of learning, went to Kenya, saw what Kenyans were doing in discipleship, and he said, that's exactly what we need in our church today. Because what he saw is something that was unprecedented. Discipleship in the US is mostly individual. Discipleship in Africa is communal. And he said, I think this is what we might need. And then it was not just communal, it was experiential. We would, uh, in, if you go to any country in the global world, the prayer sessions are three hours plus, you know? In America, we pray for two minutes and we're like, done. We're done talking to God. But it's experiential. Yeah. We talk about breaking of strongholds. Mm. In the US, we don't even think that there's strongholds. We actually don't even believe that the evil dark world exists. Mm. It's a fantasy world. Mm. So engaging some of those things. We don't think of the gospel and evangelism as a part that we actually get to share the good news. We have the cure to AIDS, but we don't share the cure to AIDS. And, but in Africa, that's what people do. Mm. And so he said, we're gonna take that and bring it over. Mm. Of course, um, customize it or at least make it contextualize it. And because of that, I have seen our church, church radically change mm. to where when the global partners come to Marinus Church, they're not received as missionaries or people. They, people look at them, these are my pastors. Mm. These are my leaders. Next week, they'll be there. We have um, about 10 of our church partners coming, and they spend time together. Every year, we meet as a global church because most of the times, you have a Western church that has partnerships with individual churches. For us, we said, we're not gonna be the fulcrum of it, we're gonna sit at the mm. table, mm. and so together every year we get to be the global church and we try and find out how does unity in diversity happen and what can we do together that we cannot possibly do apart. Yes. And so that's the idea of, of, of being able to learn together. So I've been able to see that happen and it's actually a beautiful, beautiful aspect and Rooted Now has been taken over by over 900 churches around the US. Oh. Something that started in my home church in Kenya is now not only at Mariner's Church, but it's in 900 churches across the U.S., people who are now getting to be a recipient of reverse missions, if you will. So that's one of the things that I have gotten to see, and it's been an indistinct honor and privilege to be a part of that journey. So good. Yeah. Um, there was a video this morning where yeah. students were sharing their major, biology, so good. chemistry, political science, so history. Fun. As you... Um, as you're speaking to this room, there are students uh, that probably cover every single one of those mm. majors. And for many of us, most of us probably, we will spend our life here in the US. Um, what does it look like for us, uh, someone who is not going to live overseas, to be a missionary That's in our good. own context? That's good. I love the concept that when, when God sees a problem, he sends a person. Mm. When he saw the people of Israel suffering, he called Moses and says, I have heard, I am concerned, I have come down. And then he tells Moses, you go. Mm. You know, if I was Moses, I'd have looked at God and said, you have seen, you have heard, you have concerned, you go. <laughs> Why are you sending me? It's true. You know, don't send me, you go. Yeah. But whenever God sees a problem, he sends a person. There's mm. many places that there's many challenges. And God has sent you, and that's why I love the video. Mm. Because you'll be my disciples in science and technology, yeah. media arts. Mm. Kanji, who's seated here with us, God it gave him the influence in the media space. Mm. And in Kenya, if you go to Kenya today, it's maybe one of the few countries where Christian music or gospel music is the number one in the country. So when a corporate like Coca-Cola has an event, they don't call the secular artists, they call Kanji and the gospel artists in Kenya. And the reason why they did that is because Kanji and others decided to start a movement known as CTA, Clean the Airwaves. Mm. And he started doing music with a positive influence. And it influenced the country to the point where it actually became the number one music in the continent. Wow. Kanji doesn't happen to be a musician who happens to be a Christian. He's a Christ follower who's been called into the field of music and the arts. And he is restoring the dignity that God wants to be in that place. And so that video is really telling, is that there are some people, yes, who have been called to church and mission. That's a, that's a, that's a space, that, that's a sector that needs it. But even more importantly, who are the business people who are gonna rethink business in such a way that we're not gonna have a place where 
you know, the world has actually enough resources for every man's need, but not enough for one man's greed, Mahatma Gandhi said. Mm. Are there business people that can help rethink that? So I think entering that space, um, the sectors of society, with a different mindset of looking at yourself not as a doctor who happens to be a Christian, but as a Christ follower who's been called to influence the sphere and the sector of business will be a big, big, big part of it. And so mm. when God sees a problem, he sends a person, if you know your story, if you know who you are, and you know where that sector God has put you into, then that space for you is to, to influence and take that dominion and reign and bring God's reign and God's kingdom in it. And so I'm really excited that the Biola students are looking at themselves as a missionary yeah. to those different spaces. Yeah. I, I was having a conversation recently with one of my best friends who pointed out to me that when God commissions Moses to go and build a tabernacle, the first person that God kind of anoints to do anything is an artist. Yeah. It's not the Levites, yep. it's not the, the priests, so it's an artist. Yeah. And God cares about art and using art for his glory. He does. Yeah. Come on. He does. Yeah. God cares about education and English and sign language and the, the different things that we study and are passionate about our gifts. Um, as we seek to use those gifts, you mentioned this earlier, I think there's a, a pendulum that kind of swings sometimes between generations and uh, we, we look at an evangelism kind of heavy generation yeah. before us and we, we swing a bit towards social justice. Christian, how do we hold uh, the importance of social justice and not let go of it for a second, but also <laughs> see the importance of gospel proclamation in each of our, our individual fields and careers that we're going into? Yeah, I think proclamation and demonstration have to go together. Mm -hmm. I, th I think this is the time of the season that we do both. And if you look at Jesus, even like in, I think it's in Luke 4, where his first TED Talk, Jesus' first TED Talk, <laughs> or his first inauguration speak, speech, he comes, he's, I've come to bring the good news to the poor, set the captives free. He's talking about proclamation, gospel proclamation, and gospel demonstration. And he did those, he went about preaching the gospel, healing the blind, you know, and so the demonstration and proclamation have to go together, one without the other. The proclamation helps us understand the why of the gospel. The demonstration shows you how mm -hmm. and the heart of it. And so the two have to, have to go together. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, as I think about that, I think about um, Jesus' missions mm -hmm. model was the most fascinating thing that I've ever seen in my life. If you look at Philippians 2, it says that he who was glorious and most powerful, when he decided to come on a mission field, the mission field in the world, how does he come in? Weak, vulnerable, dependent, enculturated. Mm. And he came, can you imagine Jesus' missions report for 30 years? What do you think Jesus sent his missions report for 30 years? My dad and I built another cabinet. Talk about <laughs> us that as an ROI for missions, you know? You can't use that as an ROI for missions mm. because the way he came in was quiet, humble, meek, gentle. He inculturated. And then when he starts his ministry, he actually starts, he picks up some dudes and tells them, come. And these dudes actually change the world. You and I are sitting here because of those 12 dudes. Mm. He began in with the people who are in there. And so being able to, but then he told them, the things that I'm doing, you'll do greater things. You're going to proclaim the gospel, but you're also going to demonstrate it. The words that I bring to you are not just words, they come with power. And so the two coming together is such an impoverty, a, a pivotal aspect of rebuilding this. And Jesus' missions model is one of the most confounding. The cross, what does it mean to suffer with? What does it mean to sit with? That's part of the gospel. I don't think we in, in the Western world, we try and move away our problems. In the global world, they learn how sometimes to sit and to uh, endure through their problems. What an incredible opportunity for us to demonstrate the gospel in a different way. It's not just about giving things, but it's about being able to sit with. The cross is another thing. The other thing that you look at Jesus' model is that the Holy Spirit, he came and he said, I'm not gonna leave you alone, I'm gonna leave you the Holy Spirit who will go on and do greater things than I leave. What, for me, that I look at it as sustainability. What goes on after you're gone? What goes on after you're gone? A lot of us are so into the things of dropping in and dropping out versus creating something that will go on after we're gone. So demonstration, proclamation have to, to go together and um, we cannot swing the pendulum one way so hard that we miss out on the, the gospel, the good news, but also we miss out and actually demonstrating mm. how God's love is for us. Mm. 
Man, <laughs> Christian, you went to law school. Yeah. You have been a musician. You are now a pastor in a church. You've done a lot of different things in your life. Yeah. And I think that for many of us, the biggest question that kind of feels like it's sitting on our shoulders is, like, what the heck should I actually do with my life? <laughs> yeah. And uh, there was a, a, a session last night where students pulled out their phone and had a flashlight. And uh, one of them, one of the questions that was asked, the students would respond, hold up their flashlight if they agreed with it, That's was good. who has questions about the future? And I don't know if there was uh, anyone who didn't hold up their flashlight for that one. Yeah. We all have questions about the future. This is uh, a season uh, as college students where we often don't know what lies beyond. Um, you've done a lot of things. Yeah. What word of advice would you give to students as they're trying to discern what it looks like to be uh, a missionary, but doing so in a certain field? What, what word of advice would you, would you give to students? Yeah. I think the one thing is I'd say embrace and engage your story. Hmm. Embrace and engage your story. Because if you want to know the clue, if you want to look at a clue for what God wants to do with you, just look at your story. What is it that God has, just listening to you today, I was so inspired just by your story of going to Ghana, um, getting to meet Jonathan, and today, part of your discipleship or missionary journey is you and your family being able to bring Jonathan to be not only in your family, but to become your brother. That's a whole different ball game of, of missions. And the reason you did that is because you embraced your story. The very things that are happening in your life are the very things that God may want, may be the clue to what you're gonna do and to what he wants you to do. The places that your heart breaks. The things, today I get to be a bridge builder. But that's because I knew what it is to live in poverty and I knew what it is to live amongst the rich. And I was confounded by the two. It's one of the hardest things to live in this too. But for me, I've been given that clue. Is that part of my story is a story of brokenness, a story of pain, a story of defeat, but a story of coming to Newport and, get, and being a part amongst a wealthy group of people. Mm. I embrace and I engage my story. A lot of us don't want to enter the very pain of our stories, but I'll tell you that our clue for the life of where God wants us to be is really hidden within our story. Mm. So then I'd say engage your story, embrace your unfair advantage, but also engage your fatal flaw <laughs> because we all have fatal flaws mm. in us. But those are clues and guides that can help us be able to make a difference in our world. So get to know your story, so embrace the depth of it, and then out of it, God will show you what you have to go and, mm. and, and be a part of restoring. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ben Stewart uh, spoke last night. He shared about uh, the greatest thing that the enemy can do to try to fight back against Jesus is to convince God's children that he doesn't their dad doesn't really love them. Yeah. He's not really there for them. Yeah. And <laughs> as, as we wrestle with that in each of our individual lives, and hearing your words to embrace the story that God has been writing in each and every one of us. Um, <laughs> Christian, I have a friend who was going towards church ministry and um, through uh, counseling and growth, realized that that's not really actually where he was supposed to be and is now doing incredible work in the film industry and yeah. is making an impact in Hollywood uh, in a way that he never would have been able to before. And I have a friend who um, was going towards um, Hollywood and media and is now actually pivoted and, and is doing mission work in the Middle East. <laughs> that might be uh, something that's stirring in uh, many of our students. Uh, yeah. I, I've been thinking that I was going to do this one thing. I felt like maybe even God called me to that. But now I feel something different stirring in my heart. Uh, that can feel heavy to hold. Like, yeah. am I disappointing God if I do something different than I thought I was going to do? Yeah. Uh, am I letting him down? Am I not really accomplishing his mission? Um, you <laughs> have done so much around the world, Christian. Um, as you see this next generation come up, uh, how do we practically embrace our story? That's good. Uh, what does it look like for us to actually embrace that uh, and to follow Jesus wherever he might lead us? Yeah. Um, our stories are the currency of human contact. Mm -hmm. So getting to know your story, then I ask, uh, behooves you to engage somebody else's story, mm -hmm. which means then you have to enter into relationship. Yeah. I think that's something that will be a big clue for us in the future, is to be in relationship 
and to actually care about other people's story. But to care about other people's story, we need to understand our own story. And so as you engage your own story, then what happens is that God continues guiding you because life never happens in a straight line. Life happens gradually and then suddenly. You don't wake up one day and you're a junkie. You start slowly and one day you find yourself. Life happens gradually and then suddenly. And you see, as we embrace our stories, as we take the, the next right turn, then we can, we can hear God's voice saying recalculating, but what it calls for us to do is to embrace the human contact. Our currency as humans is our stories. Mm. And so if we'd be careful enough to stop and listen to your story, today, you've changed my life just by hearing your story. Likewise. Sitting down and he hearing your story, that changed my life. What if everybody in this room got to understand their story, embrace their brokenness, and embrace their restoration, and then did that with another person, I think would be able to change our mission field and our mission work in ways that we can never ever rethink. So that's all I'd say with that. I'd just say embrace your story and engage other people's stories. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.